I'm going to try to get through. Uh, I think I'll get us started um, with just kind of basic introductions. So I, I want to start by just if you need, if you want some of the materials that we're presenting, I've posted them in the chat box uh, as a PDF. You could also email me uh, here and I will post that again um, a little bit later. <laughs> Let me make one minor challenge. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, we'll repost um, the file. Should be right at the top. So if you just go click to the top, you should be able to download it. Can you see that, Helen? No, well, I see it, but I think it's because I was already in the room when you shared it. Okay. Well, okay. Do not look at the man behind the curtain. Okay, so as that's loading. Um, so in this presentation or this workshop, uh, we're going to present our point of view uh, coming from Brooklyn as a global hub. So we deal with uh, a large number of global students, um, including international students, uh, but also students who are either first or second generation immigrants and bring that global experience with them. Uh, as well as a global uh, injustices, global challenges, uh, and a way of thinking about working with faculty and administrators to think about the, US, uh, the UN sustainability goals uh, as a method of inquiry for our students uh, to enter into the concept of, of rights and of injustice, uh, and in some levels uh, of power. Um, Stuart Parker and I from sociology were human rights fellows last semester, and we redesigned some curriculum specifically around uh, the UN sustainability goals. Uh, but we looked at it from a point of view from our practice over the last 10 years uh, in developing civic engagement materials. Um, so the first person we'll kind of introduce is Helen Margaret Nasser, who's also been working with us uh, now for almost 10 years uh, on civic engagement co-curricular activities. Uh, and who also has been kind enough to come into our classrooms uh, and work with us there as well. Um, if you, we're gonna have kind of what would be called polling questions, uh, and if you can answer those in the chat box, that would be wonderful. Uh, we will also pause from time to time to see uh, if you have any questions, comments, or if you'd like to talk a little bit further about some of the material that we're pre presenting. So at this point, I will turn it over to Helen. Thanks, Jason. Um, so, as Jason mentioned, I'm the director of our Student Union and Intercultural Center at Kingsborough Community College. Kingsborough is located in Brooklyn, New York, and we have a very diverse uh, student body. We have just under the semester, virtual and all, we have just about, um, just under 10,000 students. And um, they come from over 140 different countries, speaking 70 different languages. So, as Jason mentioned, it's a hugely diverse uh, classroom as a result and there's a lot of richness that our students bring that as faculty and as administrators we try to um, include especially within our student union and intercultural center we do want to create exactly that a space where our students see themselves where there is program that represents them and that's a safe and inclusive environment for all of them so that is um, what we strive to do and our work started um, through a Bridging Cultures grant that was funded um, by AACNU and also through the Democracy Commitment. And uh, so that's how we had our, the, the genesis of our, of our partnership. So you have an administrator, you have a faculty member, 
Stewart's her chairperson. So it starts like the beginning of a joke, but that really does create important partnerships with the end goal really being student success. So as an administrator, it's natural for me to want to make these alliances, make these partnerships, so that way it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship where our students are benefiting, our faculty are benefiting, and the administrators are there to really kind of help bridge any gaps and listen to what's needed on both ends of that spectrum. So how do we do this work? Um, that's an interesting conversation. And how do we do this work virtually is the million dollar question that we've been asking ourselves and tested to do this uh, these last few months. Uh, I know that each campus has different configurations for how they're offering classes. So just to give you a background, Kingsboro is largely uh, remote. Uh, the only students that are on campus are those that have uh, technical components like fashion design or maritime technology or labs. But with that, there's only a handful of students on campus at a time. So largely, by and large, we're, we're remote. Um, so what does civic engagement look like on our campus? Um, in the past, we've been fortunate enough to bring um, faculty and staff and speakers from across the country to help our students see themselves as agents of change, see themselves in the speakers that we invite to campus. So that's something that's very important. Our civic uh, engagement is to help students see that they are at the center of change not to wait till someone does it for them, not to wait until they have a fancy degree or a cushy job, that they're capable of creating change right now. So um, this is just a handful of some of the speakers that we've invited. We just had this past week our congressmen come, and that's important for our students to see who their elected officials are, that they make time to speak to their students, that they look like them and have come from backgrounds like them so that they can begin to identify themselves in the political process when often they feel that the political process doesn't represent them. So largely, we do want to continue our civic engagement mission of creating safe and representative events for our students. Our community at this time needs a lot. And when I say community, that means all of us. So I'm sure with COVID-19 and remote work and all of this, we've all had different degrees of okayness. Sometimes we feel really good and we can handle everything and everything's going smoothly. And sometimes it's a disaster and you're not sure what's working and what's not working and you don't know what to do next. So at this time, you know, we need validation, we need empathy, we need support. Um, and even at Kingsborough, we've had limited resources given, given this uh, climate. So it's even a larger call for collaboration. So if I have a limited budget and you have a limited budget and we know that our students have limited attention spans via Zoom, so why not collaborate and say, okay, you wanna have an event like this. I wanna have an event like this. Let's join forces so we can guarantee that we're putting all of our energy into something that we know is going to succeed rather than competing with each other and also competing for the limited attention of our students. Um, so this has been really nice during this time. Um, our Kingsboro Historically Underrepresented Faculty and Staff Resource Center has reached out and will be planning programming in terms of how to do this work in that collaborative nature. This is also tying in with our Achieving the Dream uh, work that we do to make sure that we're continuing to promote and be mindful of equity during these times, especially with resources, um, emotional support, technological support. How can we be very cognizant of the challenges that our students are facing and uh, support our programming around the needs of our students. In addition to all of that, we need to listen to one another, um, especially to our students. Uh, if we had all the time in the world, I'd love to sit and have a cup of tea with all of you and say, how are you guys doing? And I think as administrators, it is important to talk to our students and talk to our faculty and take that temperature. Um, yes, we're here to do our jobs. Yes, we're going to serve our students and do the very best that we can but we also have to be listening to hear what our students and faculty and staff are needing. Um, asking questions, taking a time to hear how everyone's doing and building that support network. Uh, with that, I again stress the importance of building teams and collaboration. This is a heavy lift. Um, and I think if we can do that together, then we can work on sustainability. We mentioned the sustainable development goals. I think sustainability is a big, a uh, word for all of us. We don't know how much stamina we need for this virtual environment that we're in. 
Are we in it for the long haul? We don't know what's next. So I think having that sustainable mindset, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of our students and make sure that our programming reflects that. Another important thing is trying to think of how we can put all of this together into different agendas. So again, still this comes back to civic engagement work, still this comes into what do our students need. Yes, they might be zoomed out, but at the same time, we still want to make sure that they have that community feel, we still want to make sure that they have that campus environment. So oftentimes when I'm planning my events, I wonder who's going to come to another thing on Zoom, but they miss that community. And what's important about these types of events is that it makes a crucial bridge between what's happening in the classroom and what's happening in the real world. So when they hear Congressman Jeffries, it kind of makes their uh, political science classes seem more relevant. It makes their sociology classes more relevant. They get to see how all of these concepts are put into action and how they're applied. When we have a, a, a community organizer, an activist like Heather Booth, they see how this work can make changes. So they get to understand that what they're learning in class has immediate uh, applications. And I think it's important for our students to see that. Um, we'll also be planning in the next few weeks trainings for our faculty that we've been doing for the last several semesters to make sure that our faculty are more sensitive uh, to the needs of our DACA and undocumented students. Now, no, more than ever, our DACA and undocumented students need support. They've been at the front lines as essential workers and uh, frontline workers, and they've also been very instrumental in, in the fight for COVID-19, but they've also been on the other end of the spectrum where they've lost income, they've lost employment. So we have to be mindful of that. So how can we make sure that we're looking at every instance that's happening in the outside world and being mindful of how this affects our students? Just yesterday as well, we had a psychologist come and talk about the impact of COVID-19 and anti-Asian racism. This was an event that we had marketed for a student audience, but I was pleasantly surprised when the majority of attendees were faculty and staff who wanted to be there to see how they could better support their students and understand the reality of this concern for our students. Something that they may not be experiencing themselves, but aware that this is something that their students might be facing. So in every layer of these things, we can see what we can do in our role as an administrator, as a faculty member, as a student, as a chairperson, how can we think about what's happening in this moment and how it's affecting our different uh, populations that we're here to serve? And of course, in New York State, the next day, the last day to register to vote is today. So we've been doing a very large push to make sure that our students are ready to vote, register to vote, if they're not eligible, that they're filling out the census and understanding the implications of their vote. It's not just for the president, it's for your Congress people, it's for the people that affect your day to day lives. How is that important? How does that affect you? And having an opportunity to have that dialogue where they feel um, disaffected by politics or disconnected. How can we have that discussion to talk about why it's important and why it matters in every role, in every instance of what's going on in today's world? So these are crucial things. Yes, they're extracurricular or co-curricular, but largely we want to make sure that it's not something that they attend just for the extra credit or just because they want to check off a box. They are very clear that they understand the meaning of these events. And then we've been often having reflective components at the end of each event. How did you like the event? What did you learn? What was the impact? So that way I know that I can do better, but also I can see what is impacting our students and what uh, grabs their attention. So that again, we can make sure that in their limited times, we're being more strategic in how we can address our student needs. So I think, so now, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah. So w one of the things that I think, you know, we've started this off with is what you might call pragmatic idealism. Um, so I, I might take us back to 2013 uh, when Helen and I were asked to do a presentation on, yeah, but how do you actually do it? Uh, and so the two things we want to kind of highlight uh, on this particular um, segment is both over here collecting using Google Forms to collect student reactions. Uh, and at first, you know, we were mostly thinking about that in the sense of documenting how many students were there uh, and, you know, giving those lovely sound bites that uh, many administrators like to put into their reports. Uh, but in that process, we started to also see it as a, a learning tool to see how our students uh, 
taking the knowledge that they're gaining from the classroom from, say, my class uh, or Professor Parker's class and then trying to apply it. Uh, and oftentimes this coming up with something we're going to talk uh, about in a little bit with threshold knowledge and with um, PPRIMs. And so I think uh, to kind of bring that to maybe a, a bit of a confession, uh, you'll see that Helen and I also, for the first time, tried to do a Zoom YouTube video. Uh, and, um, you know, I want to celebrate our failures as well as our successes. Uh, we did a lovely video. It was wonderful. I loved it. Um, very late at night uh, <laughs> in our spare time. And then I had forgot to record the audio. Um, so, of course, we had to do it again. But I think this kind of humbling experience helps us understand what students must be going through as well as our fellow colleagues. Um, and so I think where we want to go from here is to how do you take this kind of pragmatic idealism uh, that Helen and I have kind of struggled with over the years uh, and bring it now into the classroom uh, and fully immerse it? And, and Stuart is going to take over uh, and describe a learning activity that he's been working on. Okay, um, <clears throat> welcome. Glad you all um, chose to spend a Friday afternoon. I don't know whether it's sunny where you are, um, but it is here, but uh, to talk about this for a bit. So like Jason said, um, there's historically been a disconnect sometimes between the civic engagement initiatives that happen on campuses in extracurricular and co-curricular activities and what actually happens in the classroom. Um, and often they're on two separate parallel tracks. And so what I'd like to share is um, partly a result of a research project that Jason and I have been doing that combines pedagogy and conceptual development with this idea of how do we move students from a, um, when they enter our classes in a more kind of passive receptive mode about trying to gather information to a more um, activist or proactive identity and orientation where they see that they can actually make change in the world. And so we want to introduce this idea of threshold concepts. It's not original to us, but um, it's an idea that helps instructionally organize curriculum and pedagogy around key ideas within the discipline that um, in terms of the literature are seen as once a student has grasped that overarching idea, they've crossed a threshold into thinking like a practitioner in that discipline. So in my own dis discipline of sociology, um, one of those uh, threshold concepts would be the social construction of reality. Um, once a student grasps that there are multiple factors influencing the shared development of a, this is how the world works conception, um, then they can begin to look at all the different topics within sociology and all the subfields and disciplines as part of an examination of this larger process. Um, and so that's why that the threshold concept is important because it allows us over several semesters and in a way connecting to co-curricular and other kinds of activities, this uh, a conceptual framework for thinking about the world in a particular way. So this project that we put together, or I put together for my class in this project that Jason and I were in, um, is aimed at helping students move through this conceptual development process that I'm gonna describe in just a minute, through a research project. Um, and it, the research project is connected to the concept within sociology of collective action. And so given that our community of Brooklyn is also a mini sociology lab, um, we're gonna have students explore the Black Lives Matter protests in terms of what were the factors that led some people to choose to participate in um, public protests and other folks choose not to. Um, and so this is really an inquiry-based model. Uh, we're gonna group the students into, create groups of students and ask them to generate lists of questions, um, explain and understand the um, concept of 
methodology and, and those key ideas. Um, and then they're going to be able to choose and develop a data collection strategy, either interviews, surveys, a combination of both, um, develop a participant recruitment strategy, how they're going to find uh, participants and what, how is that going to potentially skew their data. And then they're going to collect the data. And then individually, the second component is that they're going to create not just a paper that I'm going to read. Um, I'm not the primary audience for this. Um, the idea is that they create a, a working paper, which kind of synthesizes their ideas and key summaries from the from the data that they collect. And then they've got to, I'm going to ask them to choose a public site, some a blog, a website, um, some kind of public space where, because this is a very live question these days, um, and, and publish a contribution, right? They're going to contribute to a, the public conversation, which is why we do our research in the first place. Um, and so just as a sidebar, Jason, you want them to discuss this in the chat box and then go to the next part or? Yeah, some folks have already. So, um, okay. you know, if you if you feel comfortable, if you want to throw in uh, what would be a threshold concept um, or, a, or a challenge that you see learners face um, in your area. Okay. So you, you want to scroll down just to, to the next uh, as there as people are throwing out ideas? Positionality is definitely important. Um, and so the what Jason and I have been working on is this notion that we've uh, borrowed from the physics education literature in terms of, of just trying to describe how conceptual development actually occurs. And so there's this notion that our students walk into class with what's called a, a set of philosophical primitives or P primitives. Our students don't walk in with a blank slate. Um, they walk in with certain ideas, some of which aren't even, they're not even aware of, they're not even consciously, explicitly thinking about. Um, but in this case, in this whole question of collective action, um, when you look at student responses to initial questions at the beginning of a unit, um, there are things like, People do think do this. They engage in protest because they're outraged or they're hurt. Um, they engage in protest because there's some legitimate act, uh, grievance. The idea being that the most of our students' initial answer to this question is that there's an internal state that people feel that motivates them to action. The second, where we want to begin to move, this is. This uh, table can be seen as a, a map of where we want our students to go. And so we start with where they're at, which is the PPRIM, right? And then the next step is to try to develop that, make that more explicit and add some more features to it. So a coordinating class is what students begin to put together as they begin to see that there's more factors involved in a particular situation that things are more complicated. Um, so that collective action, in order to be effective, there's issues like whether it's low cost and or high cost. Um, there has to be a perception that this is more effective than individual effort, that there's some kind of um, social context and meaningfulness to this effort. Right? And some people feel like protests matter and can make a difference, other people don't but they can begin to explore that in more sophisticated ways by looking at their data. And ultimately, at the causal net um, stage, this third stage is really about how scholars in the field would begin to understand and try to make sense of this question about collective action. And so if you read the literature around collective action, you read a lot about narrative analysis and trigger events and how there's this disjuncture oftentimes between formal goals and actual practice and the unpredictability of um, the influence of particular instances, inc incidences to 
larger rebellions like we saw after the murder of George Floyd. Um, so that's the strategy. Um, we're using the research project as a strategy for moving students through these three um, levels without anticipating that we're going to get all the way down to the causal net. Um, it's just one semester. Um, so if we can get students to begin to think in a coordinating class level, um, we'll be um, very happy. So we've created this fillable Google Doc, um, which is something that you can do uh, on your own time after uh, if you're interested about trying to organize what you see in your own classrooms in terms of students' beliefs and uh, levels of knowledge and how in any domain um, you might make that a little more sophisticated, how that, how might that process of growth might occur. Um, and this is obviously trying to move classrooms beyond merely the teaching of facts and the assessment of whether students have can define all these different facts or not, like what is I find in a typical sociology textbook, to thinking, beginning to think and also act like a, both a sociologist and an active citizen in the community. So this is really an example, an attempt at creating a basis within the classroom for supporting and feeding into the activities that Helen was talking about outside the classroom that are all kind of meshed towards a common goal of creating students with this um, more activist orientation towards the uh, civic engagement process. So I don't know if you want to scroll down to well, the graph. Stuart, I'm wondering, I, you know, because I think if we were in physical reality, right, with people, I think this would be the yeah. part where um, at least I'd want to hear from the folks who are in the room. Like, how, does this register with you? Does this does this seem helpful? Um, yep. I That's doubt good. we need to explain more about the background of it, but I'm I'm wondering also for uh, Nicole and Michelle. I mean, is this a fair kind of rendition of of what you were explaining in the chat box um, that I've tried to just you know very quickly try to set as a PPRIM uh, if I was going to try to deal with it in my particular classroom. Uh, and people can unmute um, and or talk in the chat, whatever's more comfortable for you. Yeah, I just, I can just say quickly, I think that this is there's a, a very useful approach to um, trying to get at some of these things. And and I, I appreciate what you said in, in one semester, you can only get so far. And so really narrowing it down to the point where, you know, what it, what's the most important and, and how to focus in on that and how to kind of what are those triggers. So I think this is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I, uh, yes, I, I just wanted to comment on the, the, the idea that, you know, it, it almost follows the, the, the trajectory that we try to, to uh, work with students to get from a very kind of linear way of seeing subjects in the world and their skills and their relationship to the world to a, you know, a broader, more world centric kind of view that's, you know, embodied in their skills and what they're able to demonstrate through their knowledge and through their abilities mm -hmm. uh, in the classroom. And I'm, I, I like this model. I think I'm going to try to use it, but I, I can't visualize yet how it translates exactly to to what to an activity or to something that I would do, but I really like the idea. No, thank you. Yeah, it's taken us a while to figure this out. It didn't, uh, but I, I think all of the activities that Helen was describing when she's bringing in different speakers and creating different kinds of forums um, lead to that multiple positions, seeing the world as a complex kind of place. And as instructors, I don't think we've always done are part of the job in terms of giving students a more discipline oriented or a more disciplined conceptual framework for thinking about that. Um, and so I think that's limited the number of students that we've been able to reach 
um, in some ways. Um, and I'll just mention as well, I mean, what we're asking is this introspective of, of understanding your P prims, like that's something too that is a process, an individual process. So it definitely, that, that conversation you have with yourself and it shifts and you don't even realize or you haven't pinpointed it just yet. So as an individual, that definitely takes time as you come into your into terms with yourself and your identity and in different circumstances. But what's great is that what we've seen in the classroom and what we've seen through our events is that even if a student's struggling to articulate how their what their position may be, they'll see someone that A, looks like them or looks completely nothing like them and realize that there are similarities there. And I think that that's something that um, helps them gain confidence in understanding and unpacking what their P prims are, how that they can uh, advance them, what is their identity, and then that gives them a little bit of courage in terms of figuring out who they are, what their positions are, and what they can do about them. So whenever we invite an external speaker to campus, you know, obviously I have an idea of what I want them to address, but I give them two main talking points. Why should our students care about this issue and what can they do about it? So it's not just some abstract lecture that the students are going to hear, because of course the speaker always thinks that it's riveting and super engaging, but the two main questions, why does this matter to our students and what can they do about it? Because those two questions elicit immediate responses and actions from our students so that way we know that they're going to identify with the issue and hopefully have an avenue where they can take action to find a solution, whether this affects their group directly or whether this affects a group that they could be an ally towards. So I think I think George asked a question that was, yeah, so this is contextualizing um, to answer that question. If I, if I understand what you mean by political bias, um, I'm not sure if you mean in the conversation that folks are having now with implicit bias or within political bias in the classroom, um, i.e. a teacher taking a political position against a student. Um, so George, could you, do you want to explain that briefly? Uh, yeah, I mean, when, when you say that students come in like a, uh, well, uh, like a, a blank slate or maybe not like a blank slate and, and, you are, you are, um, um, and you are, you're giving them guidance what, what, where is the guidance going? What, what kind of angle are you taking? Uh, what, what is, what is, what are your, what are your, um, uh, what are your principles exactly? Or when you invite speakers, for example, what, what kind of angle are they taking? Uh, are you, are you inviting speakers from a certain political perspective, or are you inviting speakers from all perspectives? How, how are you, how are you? Uh, how are you forming? Uh, uh, how are you forming the, those those students? In, in what kind of direction is it going? So, okay, I, I think I that's answer, a, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I just answer it. Should, from a classroom point of view, in terms of the discipline, my goal is always to get students to ground their arguments in data. Right. So many of my students enter the classroom at the beginning of the semester. Um, having opinions about lots of things, but not necessarily knowing where those opinions came from or what they're based on. So it's not a, a exercise in like partisanship as much as it is an exercise in rigor, intellectual rigor, that um, there's no right answer from a content point of view. And what the PPRIMS causal net and coordinating class system helps instructors think about is that what we're trying to do is um, promote increasing levels of intellectual sophistication and thought, not a particular partisan view of the world. And so um, in our assessments of student learning, we're not saying anything like, oh, have they, you know, are they now more in support of, say, a national health care, national health insurance program uh, than they were before? It's does their writing reflect a level of conceptual organization and sophistication that we're looking for in terms of its connection to data, its reliance on arguments, and its awareness of the multiple factors that are involved in creating the situation. 
So I, th I think that might be, you know, in terms of bias, I think that's that's where what's happening in the classroom. Although I might zoom out a bit. I think that was a very, you know, very zoomed in kind of idea. Um, so I think to, to kind of put it into a larger context, where Helen and I kind of started with this question uh, was not from our own political point of view, but as political scientists, um, we had coordinating classes, like different attitudes towards uh, the concept of power, uh, different attitudes as far as you know international relations, et cetera. And so these two kind of, if we were biased in, in the sense of academic, we were biased by participatory democracy uh, and through dialogue construction. And I think this is where we kind of found a mutual partner with Stuart uh, by looking at kind of the construction of, of community. So to give you a concrete example, um, through the Bridging Cultures work, Helen and I were asked to look at immigration, um, and that was a huge issue at our campus, because uh, as we had said, most of our students come from immigrant families, uh, which was very politically charged uh, even before you know 2016, going back you know into the early 2000s. So we understood the kind of idea of, of, of teachers, especially at our campus, who would take very active uh, political stances and who would, uh, I would say, harm students, to be honest, uh, by their assessments of whether the student had changed their political perspective uh, within their classroom. So one thing that Helen and I tried to do uh, was talk to students, which I, I, I know sometimes sounds um, obvious, uh, but, but very few people were doing it at our campus. And so the ideas of what kind of events that students wanted uh, were coming from students themselves. And one thing that I was totally blind to, for example, um, in teaching my constitutional law class was I took it for granted that students had a historical understanding of colonialism um, and the difference between, say, settlers and immigrants. So when we were saying, you know, America is an immigrant, uh, a community of immigrants, you know, that's not shared by all people and that's not shared by all people in history. Um, so as students started to you know, ask questions and say, we don't know anything about this, um, we started targeting our work to try to bring more information um, so that they could do the kind of things that Stuart is asking them to do in his sociology class. Um, I might add that we were in the middle of a liberal arts review, uh, so we had some freedom and flexibility to start seeing where these things um, kind of overlap. But I, you know, I would probably ask Helen to explain more about um, how that has evolved with the kind of um, events, you know, like Heather Booth and, and Congressman Jeffries. Yeah, I mean, again, because our campus is so hugely diverse, we want to invite speakers who students can identify with. So, you know, we've had Congressman Jeffries, and we preface that event that he's not here to promote. Invited him because he is a politician who's going to invite students to understand why their role in politics is important, and the role of political participation by young people. So that was, a, we always preface that they're not here to promote their party. They're here to protect, uh, promote youth engagement and participation in the political process, in our democracy. So many times in our work, we stress that democracy only works if everyone's participating. Um, so we, that's the message. When we invite, invite political um, officials, it's in that capacity. They're not here to promote their platform or their agenda. They're here to have students understand what was their particular path to politics, what compelled them to take on this career, how could students find their own entry points and issues that matter to them, and then how could they participate in the process. So, and same when we invite uh, political uh, or uh, community organizers like Heather Booth, we're not there um, to tell them what issues they should be um, creating change around. We're giving them the tools to do so and the power and the courage to do so. So they can choose to become activists for any issue that they choose to be important, that are important to them. We're not going to prescribe that for them. But we want to give them the tools and the knowledge that if they feel compelled, there's an issue that is important to them. We tell them, listen, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. This isn't something you have to do from scratch. There are organizations, there are groups that you can join that can help you with this work. But we want them to know that they are needed in the process and that they are capable of making a contribution towards change. So, George, I'm wondering, is that, I mean, because I'm, I'm still seeing that what we experience um, is folks do come in with their, with their political bias, especially educators in the classroom. And I, you know, I, I see that happening in all of these PPRIMs. Um, from students, and students are oftentimes trying to match 
you know, what they think their, their professors want from them. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think, I think it is extremely important uh, not to impose anything on students, not to impose any, any ideology or philosophy on students and just, uh, and just provide them with, with knowledge uh, as, as unbiased as possible. And, uh, and, and, and uh, give them the tools, I mean, to, to bring about change, but, but, but not in a biased way. And, and when, you know, when you, when you mentioned the, the thing with Black Lives Matter, I mean, this, this topic is so, is so charged with, with, with politics and with, uh, uh, you know, with violence going, uh, going with, uh, going with the movement and all that. It's so charged. And uh, I wonder if, if, if it is possible at all to, uh, I mean, to, to, to teach that, uh, in, in an unbiased way, is it is it possible? I, I think it's not only possible but necessary. I mean, I think given the um, the, the the politicized, heightened um, level of discussion in the mainstream media, it's incumbent on upon us as intellectuals, as scholars, as educators, to model a reasoned and dialogical approach to understanding what's going on. Because yeah. otherwise, we are abdicating any kind of reason for doing what we do, right? We, we are, if, if we have nothing to contribute to this discussion, then I think we're irrelevant. Um, but we need to be conscious of how we, I, I totally agree with you about, we need to be very conscious about how we engage in that discussion and how we model for our students a different way of thinking and being with each other about these important issues um, that might actually move at least our small group of students forward in their thinking, as opposed to what's happening in the wider world right now. Um, so I can't think of a more important topic to engage with our students. And I think, you know, I, I just said, I, mean, I, I can't, they need to see role models of a different way of thinking, acting, and um, talking with each other about these issues than they're getting from people who should know far more about what they're doing and take more responsibility for what they're doing than what, than what their actual behavior suggests. Um, that means, doesn't mean at all that we need to call these people out. You know, like I'm not sitting there, I don't talk about the president. I mean, I don't say, well, you know, this guy is lying. Um, that's not my role, right? Um, I don't engage the discussion at that level, right? I say, so here is the issue. How do we begin to understand the relationship between police and citizens? That's a sociological question. Sociologists have tools for understanding power and relationships, relations and interactions and there's institutions and there's material conditions and economic forces and political history and all of those in our discipline we've been using for 150 years to try to understand situations just like this one. Um, and so what do we do? We look at the literature, we look at the data, we take our concepts and see if they fit. Um, and all of those things are about understanding as opposed to um, creating a, you know, grinding a political axe into someone's back. Um, Although I might, and, still, I mean, I, I think one very different perspective is I'm coming from legal studies. Um, and so lying has rules of procedure, has evidentiary standards. So I don't have any problem calling out any politician who's lying um, based on the rules of evidence. In other words, uh, they haven't put authentic uh, information into what would be a courtroom, right? Because we have a very different uh, way of looking at, you know, validating knowledge claims uh, and not really looking at the truth of the matter to use a legal uh, language there. So I think um, what I have found from collecting student work 
uh, especially with Helen over the years, is that students are oftentimes being, you know, bringing in PPRIMs uh, based on what they're getting from other professors who have gone on, you know, rants and 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 just ways of explaining the world that aren't as uh, constructed as the way that that Stewart is kind of presenting. And so, um, and and to be blunt, his class, uh, Soj thirty one, is a unofficial prerequisite to the class, you know, of 66 and 67 that I teach. And so if they had kind of a, a construct where they could bring in their ideas and then kind of reformulate it uh, with some data, it will be far easier for me to teach uh, a very politically charged class uh, like the legal system and like uh, constitutional law, where I cannot avoid uh, that kind of information coming into the classroom. Okay, thank you. Did anybody else have areas that they struggle with? Uh, assessment, curriculum design, getting students to participate? And again, this work is further challenged. I mean, we know in a classroom environment, classroom participation is tricky. Um, how do you create that safe space where people feel comfortable sharing uh, their PPRIMs. And of course, doing that virtually adds another challenge. Do you know your classmates? Do you get to set that same type of safe space uh, virtually? So this is this is difficult because not only do you need to find students who get that courage to share their experiences, um, but they also don't have that connection with the uh, with their classmates when it's done virtually. So that adds another challenge um, with everything that we're doing these days as well. So Nicole, I think I'm going to try to to talk about this very difficult idea of professional development and scaling. Um, somehow I got slated with that question over the summer, um, and so I've been thinking about it, and you can help me think about it too. Um, so, so we participated as an institution in civic prompts, uh, which is really asking to look at this. Like, how do I get other people in my department to do similar work? That's, you know, that was kind of the, the translation I got. And then we're also a member of Achieving the Dream, where we're really being asked to address equity issues in the classroom and connect those to administrative inequities, hiring inequities, and then, you know, in Brooklyn, New York, community inequities, um, which, you know, sometimes is just an incredibly overwhelming uh, just thing to think about. Uh, and so... What I realized uh, as we were preparing for this uh, workshop here is that we went back and looked at our civic engagement rubrics, um, which were largely drawn from uh, materials from the AACNU, uh, but we weren't able to get to kind of those ideals uh, that I see sometimes um, in rubrics. And so what we what Professor Parker suggested was that we look at a developmental rubric. Um, so just in preparation for this um, workshop, I took some of the student examples I got from last semester, uh, where students did work all semester on the UN sustainability goals in exactly the way that Stuart had um, talked about, mainly to see what the overlap between our two classes was. Um, and I think the political knowledge domain, uh, we could find a great deal of evidence just in the fact that they're using that kind of vocabulary. Um, and I think that you know, from civic prompts, that was the easiest thing we got our other faculty members to agree with. Uh, and we all kind of understood that we could talk about rights, uh, know your rights, rights workshops, and kind of these, you know, I would call them low level um, conversations in the classroom. And that would be one way that we could scale just within our department and, and really probably outside of the department. Um, However, as a critical rights scholar, um, I wanted to see, you know, is there some other part of the domain that might be applicable? So I wanted to look for us as called social responsibility. Um, and so I looked at the PPRIMs, the initial level of development, and this is what we see uh, regularly in the classroom. And I pulled out three that I thought were good examples, um, with the exception of the bottom one. And, you know, the biggest PPRIM that we fight in my discipline is this idea that law is not only a possession, but that it's a magical possession that, you know, and I always make the joke that, you know, it's like you're waiting for the sword to fall out of uh, the sky and then now you have your rights. Um, and it makes it very difficult because students, they're not seeing the idea that rights can be used as a protection against the abuse of power. 
and they're not seeing it as a collective tool. Um, and so I agreed with that, you know, initial statement of, you know, if, if someone doesn't realize their own pos positionality, I'm lost in the classroom. And so Helen came up with a, a question years ago, um, which, you know, at first I, I wasn't even sure how it was going to go off, but it was, what groups do you belong to? Um, and while there was maybe 20% of the students that would say something like, I don't belong to a group. And, you know, I had pretty good data on why they were saying that. Um, the overwhelming majority of students were very clear about what groups they were in, um, how to kind of think about that. And there was great diversity in how they saw that. It wasn't always political. It wasn't always um, even social groups. I mean, it, some people would just pick an issue that they thought was interesting, uh, but they were talking about with their friends and family. Um, so I think that was kind of one example of, of me switching the way I taught based on thinking about the rubrics this way. Uh, the next example, I think, um, is getting closer to what, what Stuart and I are working on at present. Students who have experienced injustice seem to have a better understanding um, through the initial uh, data that I'm looking at in kind of getting past that P prim of law as an ideal. They start to see law as critically flawed, um, and they're seeing that some people have rights, but they don't have rights in their lived experience. Um, and at first I thought, great, this is going to be easy to organize them. Um, and this was the lawyer inside of me. We're, we're going to be bringing litigation and everything will change. Um, of course, as soon as we kind of got into this work, uh, like Stuart's uh, portion had said, they, they love to point out Ireland and California, for example, uh, of places where change was possible. So New York was not possible. Uh, but these two other places were possible. Now, this was because they had done the research in the class and they'd found examples. So I was trying to figure out, okay, so how do I take that knowledge uh, and what our ATD uh, leader at our institution, Stephanie, was saying is, how do you take that stuff from out there, right, and now bring it in here? And so that's what we've been, you know, really working on this semester. Uh, and, and so far, I'm only at the level of having conversations um, and that's when I came aware of, of code switching uh, as, a, as a difficulty for students. And then this newer concept um, that I'm learning about uh, through faculty, through professional development, code meshing. Um, and finding out that students um, in one-on-one -on -one Zoom conversations were telling me way more information <laughs> about their personal lives than they had in the classroom. Uh, and code meshing on a regular basis. And so I suddenly had all this data that I didn't have you know, from the classroom experience and saying, okay, the political nature of education uh, and of language uh, is now right in front of me again. Uh, and I have to think about it very similar to the ways I was thinking about it with our, our students who were interested in immigration issues. Um, and then what I found was fascinating was this last student who started off exactly how we had talked about in this model, the PPRIM. Um, but through the coordinating class, they were able to take their own lived experience with this, this student's mother uh, was a um, was a, a K through 12 educator in New York City. And so that's how they were seeing this issue was through their mother's perspective. Um, and so education became the tool that they wanted to use and the injustice, uh, but then they were able to extend it to communities that were outside of their own. They were a third, uh, third generation New Yorker, um, but they saw that this was an issue both because their mother was experiencing this in the classroom, but they were seeing it in our classrooms at Kingsboro. So this student was able to kind of start to get to this causal net uh, appreciation. Now, this is rare in my experience thus far, uh, but it could also be uh, I'm doing things very differently. So, you know, it, it could be I was the problem uh, for many years. Um, so I think this was just a helpful tool. Uh, and I kind of joke here is I rack the rubric. In, in law, we have this, you have to organize every piece of information into issue, rule, application, and conclusion. Um, and what struck me as the, the biggest P-prim um, that I was making a huge assumption was about rules. Um, and so what a rule means to a judge is very different than what a rule means to uh, a student. And especially when we think about the rules of the subway or the rules of the neighborhood or the rules of the institution, um, you know, I was suddenly, OK, I have to address this particular issue uh, with students and, and come to where they are. Um, so that was just kind of an example of how I've organized things to share with other faculty. Um, and a handful have seen it so far, and, and we're, I think that's productive. Um, I'm always a little nervous about extending it to the, the larger community, uh, but I'm working through that. 
Um, so I think that's one possibility, but I, I don't know that, you know, I would go to the next kind of question here is, so then how am I going to do this with other administrators? Uh, and then the faculty who are on the fence, um, and then Stuart and I are, and, and Helen, we're all very interested in how do we get community members to participate in this discussion? So I don't know if anybody has anything to add to that. Um, or, you know, if, if Nicole, you want to go into that a bit. Well, Nicole, in terms of scaling up too, I'll mention just as I had said at the very beginning is it is, it's a, it's a heavy lift, but you know, you can collaborate when you were talking about, you know, a large course with lots of sections. So what are some resources that you can share? You know, sometimes faculty bring guest speakers just for their own class. Well, let's open that up for the whole department or the whole campus. So, you know, let's see, maybe take an inventory of what the faculty in your in that course are doing in their specific classes and see what are some resources that would easily lend themselves to be borrowed by other faculty uh, or that could lead to some collaborative classes. Maybe they can have joint classes with another section and then the students could get to know each other differently. So I would say before doing that like heavy lift of, you know, more structured syllabi or, or, or structured outcomes, maybe just take that, do the exercise of who's doing what and how they could teach each other um, in that one specific course. And Stuart, I mean, if I think one thing that you have been able to accomplish um, in your department is, is the recognition that faculty need time to do this work. Um, so I don't know if you could talk about that at all, I think. Well, I, I think what I'm learning as a, a relatively new department chair is that it's not just time, but it's the right kind of space. Um, so we've started creating um, study groups, with small groups of faculty who already have some pre-existing relationships because we've done some other trust building kinds of things within the department um, and are able to have some of those difficult conversations like the one that you brought up, George, about how do we deal with this very fraught um, and touchy issue that we have our own feelings about as well as our students have very strong feelings about. Um, and so, and I think the other piece that we've learned is that as part of that, taking time process is that you have to create the space for, for faculty to try something and, and fail without, you know, and failure being a learning experience rather than a, a punishable event. Um, and so um, I think those are the two main things that, uh, and, and, I, and I think the other, other thing that, that I've learned is that um, oftentimes you have to introduce ideas, you know, new ways of new mental models about how to approach teaching and learning. You know, the, the different uh, thing, the, the P prim model of conceptual development is very different from like Bloom's taxonomy or other pedagogical approaches. And it, is very involved, it involves a different set of kind of assessment strategies and what you're looking at and paying attention to. Um, so there's also, like you said, the training, the, the training of instructors is tricky um, because to do this, you have to, and this has been a struggle in our institution, create that atmosphere of trust where learning is okay. And like many of us as instructors in our course, we try to, make sure it's a safe place for students to learn. Um, but as our institutions don't always organize the learning of the faculty um, in the same way and provide the same context. I know that we're gonna like automatically get, the, the, the room is gonna close automatically at some point. I don't know when that point is, but I think we might be coming close. I think we're about 12, well, 12 minutes. Right? On us. Yeah. <laughs> Any, any other thoughts about uh, what you've heard or how it might apply to you or 
questions that you uh, might still have in terms of thinking about this? We're all getting used to this this new conference format, right? It's uh, not the way we're used to doing conferences. I will just add that um, in the PDF, if you scroll down, I've got the, in, the entire matri uh, rubric so people can look at it. And then one thing that has been successful in our community, I'm, I'm somewhat torn about this, but uh, is the case study. Um, so I, I included a case study that's in the PDF um, with some guiding questions uh, and then the link to the rubric uh, if anybody would be kind enough to review it at some point and then maybe email and see it, you know, was that helpful? Um, and is there anything else we could do? Um, cause we do want to take this work back to our campus and try to, um, scale what we're doing here. Uh, so any feedback you all have would be much appreciated. I just want to say I really appreciate your approach and all of these concepts. Um, I really am wondering um, this concept of PPRIM. Um, is there kind of a, a body of literature out there? Is this this is where is this coming from from you? Do you have any suggestions on how to find out more? Um, so if you Google um, Decessa, the, 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 the originator of the approach, is called Knowledge in Pieces, um, is the general approach. So you could just Google that in Google Scholar, or the, the scholar who, who, whose work this is based on is a gentleman named Andrea Decessa, D-I-S-S-E-S-S-A. -S -S -E -S -S um, it's all lowercase. Actually, I'll put it in the chat. That's a good idea. Another one of the publications is here as well um, from 2002 um, about conceptual ecology, which was helpful for me not coming from a traditional educational PhD background. This, this made more sense for my work on climate change action um, so that I could understand what Stuart was talking about because I had my own PPRIMs uh, <laughs> that I had to battle. I don't know if we still have time, but I guess, is there a difference between PPRIMs and a preconceived notion? Is that like, well, is, is it the same thing or are we, are we talking about something different? I guess. We're certainly in the same family. Okay. Uh, yes. The, 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 so his notion of uh, a PPRIM is pretty much just a more rigorous and well-defined version of what we think of as preconceived notions um, and they behave you know so he's looking at it empirically and talking about their a number of their features how to identify them how they behave and how you move from more, a, a collection of p prims that are unrelated to each other to a coordinating class so he's taking our notion of preconceived ideas um, which he would probably call a, a, a PPRIM and trying to create a more rigorous description of both the conceptual, what he calls the conceptual ecology, the features and elements of our conceptual structure, um, and then translate that into a set of instructional strategies for how to move people from there to other places. So yeah, that, that article that I just cited that, that uh, Jason mentioned might be a good starting point. Um, and you don't, don't be daunted by the physics. The physics is not, you don't have to be a physicist. <laughs> you know, part, part of, you know, so we're working on a, a, a translation of 
because he's very much a physicist, but we're working on a translation for what does this theory look like from a social science perspective. Um, so we'll, we'll, hopefully that will be in print in the next year. Although I might just add is that um, I'm working with my seven-year-old niece um, and my, my sister had asked me to teach science. Uh, and you know, I, I was kind of curious after learning about all this introduction to physics. Um, it was far easier for her to make these connections um, with thermodynamics and gravity uh, than it was for me. So I think the thing I would add on the preconceived notions is that they're conceived. Uh, whereas with her, she was open and, and just kind of taking the world um, from a much simpler point of view uh, and not the one that, you know, I, I have kind of just taken things for granted, um, which is kind of ridiculous when I started thinking about taking gravity for, for uh, granted. But so I think there are interesting ways to make the connections. Um, and it would be wonderful if you all would, would join uh, that kind of effort, I think, because for some reason it is somewhat lacking. No, I think that's really, sorry, if I'm hogging the conversation, but I think that's really interesting, that, that idea of whether or not it's preconceived, um, and does that indicate some sort of consciousness of it? And and so I guess that maybe goes back to the question about, are you introducing something from a political bias? And so I come from an ed, ed policy background, and so um, I got a critical pedagogy type of approach to things. And, and so one of the, the things that we focus on is that there there is no such thing as unbiased, right? We're all biased in, in some way. And so we have to understand our bias. But what you were just saying is that we it's it's kind of a, a lack of awareness of what that bias is, or maybe not even having formed enough to have developed a bias. And I guess that's I'm I'm seeing that as the difference. Is that does that make sense? So when you when you read about P prims, mm -hmm. it's exactly that. It's that P prims are knowledge structures or elements that are often implicit and are not open to conscious reflection. Um, and he doesn't really talk too much about how they develop, though they obviously develop outside the classroom. Um, but his approach emerged from a discussion within the cognitive psych world where instructionally people were saying, well, you've got to take people's preconceived notions and prove to them that they're wrong. Hmm. The whole misconceptions approach. And that was a disaster. It didn't work. Right. And they, they had 20 years of data saying that, that instructional approach didn't work. And so you're absolutely right. In the critical pedagogy world, um, that's a different language for saying very much the same thing, that, that these biases, these preconceived notions, we don't necessarily consciously embrace them and they're not developed through this conscious process of, oh. You're, you're okay. 